Anita Gutberlet in Mexico at a conference about climate change and um, she was speaking about waste management which I never knew was such a fascinating subject um, but I was really interested to hear what she had to say about her work that really does a lot of the stuff that the foundation has been talking about which is connecting uh, well seeing that social justice environmental it, um, environmental issues community initiatives um, public engagement all of those things are completely connected they're basically one and the same thing and I, I found the work that she's doing in Brazil and here was really fascinating and then talking to her afterwards we were talking about things like waste to energy incineration and stuff and one thing she said that that in hindsight seems really obvious but really kind of woke me up or changed my way of thinking is is at one point she said there's no such thing as garbage and it really made me think about waste and garbage in a different way um, Anyway, so Yuta is a professor at the University of Victoria. Um, she has set up the communi community-based research. research laboratory <laughs> there, and um, I'll let you let her t t tell you about her work. Okay. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much, Ian, for the introduction, and thank you very much for having me here. It's really an honor and a great pleasure to, to be with you, uh, with you all here. I've been very much inspired by David Suzuki and the work the foundation is doing, it's, it's very important. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, so, I'm, actually I, am, I might explain a little bit why a geographer works on waste, because probably usually th people think this is more of an issue of engineers. <laughs> But uh, geographers, actually, I think the strength of geography is of being like a, a discipline of synthesis and looking at landscapes and the various layers, like the social layer, the cultural layer, the economic layer, and the environmental layer, like um, as a synthesis. And that's why um, waste or, or resources are, are key issues to be also um, addressed from, from a geography perspective. Um, but of course, geography is totally linked with sociology, anthropology, and environmental studies, etc. So it only exists because of those other, other disciplines. Um, I would like to talk to you today about um, this topic, resource recovery and strategies to address poverty reduction and also to build sustainable communities, which is an issue I've been involved in probably m almost 10 years now. <laughs> And, uh, particularly with working in Latin America. And I also have to explain that uh, a little bit of a background uh, for myself, why Latin America or why Brazil, um, but that is because I, I was born in Germany but grew up in Brazil. So when I was 12 my parents moved to Brazil, which kind of really threw me into a totally new <laughs> environment from a small village to Sao Paulo, a mega city. And I was confronted with very different issues, and I think that has very much um, influenced me. And issues of social and environmental justice are, are key issues, which I, because well, I, I saw poverty in the street, and I think that has profoundly changed my my way of, of life. Um, I've been now at Cubic for ten years, and um, over those past years, more and more, I've actually looking at, at waste, waste as a problem first, but also waste as, as solutions and opportunities, and, and um, ways to really tackle key issues, uh, even issues of climate change. So I've um, prepared this talk and uh, with the following headings, um, I would like to give first a little bit of a background and uh, linking the global with local issues and challenges then introduce the concept uh, we are working with. Uh, and when I say we, I mention, uh, I mean the community-based research lab where my students, um, masters and PhD students are working with me and uh, on sometimes similar issues as well. So there, um, th that concept of inclusive solid waste management um, is kind of innovative also in view of changing the way we are doing economy. So as a, it can be seen as a strategy towards um, transition into a new economy. Um, and then I will highlight some of our um, learnings from the participatory sustainable waste management project. And 
going to talk a little bit about that issue, waste to energy, which apparently here on the mainland is also becoming a, a big issue. Um, and it is also a big issue now in, in countries in the global south. Uh, Brazil is, is kind of being a country which is particularly targeted with, with this new technology. Um, so I will talk a little bit about that as well. So, um, well, if we look at our big global challenges, most of those challenges, they also reflect on the local. So we can actually see those issues which are global problems. Often they, they also have, a, have a, a reflect on the local, um, local space as well. And environmental degradation and contamination, I think these are really global problems. These are not only problems of the mega cities like Sao Paulo, which I will be talking more later on, but it's a, it's an issue even in Victoria. There is problems with, with um, environmental degradation and um, uh, contamination as well. Um, and linked to that, of course, resource depletion. Uh, we're still continuing with uh, expanding our frontier, be it the agricultural frontier into the Amazon or being the energy frontier with building new um, hydroelectric dams or be it with the tar sands. Um, I think there are many, many examples which show that we're kind of expanding on our, our frontiers in terms of yeah, extracting more and more and more resources. And that has a consequence, an obvious consequence of loss of biodiversity, but also loss of cultural diversity. And that is a big issue, particularly if we think about um, the Amazon, where they are targeting now new dam projects are, are, um, are in the um, yeah in the process of being implemented, like the Belo Monte Dam, which will affect uh, at least thirty thousand indigenous people in that whole region, and that means uh, if transferring those populations, that means loss of culture and. and um, that's a huge loss of our cultural diversity as well. And um, also global and local issues, inequities or inequalities, they are also very visible. I work with the recyclers in Brazil, the Catadores, but there is also recyclers here in Vancouver, the Binners in Victoria, in most of the big cities in, in Montreal. They are now starting to organize as well, similar to the United We Can. But it's an issue which is um, present in most cities. In Germany, there are spinners, um, and so it's it's not just in the global south that issues of inequality are happening. But it's actually uh, it's a global issue. And one of the motors behind that is actually that we're still following a model, an economic development model, which is growth oriented. Everything is always focusing on growth. We have to grow, economy has to grow, everything has to grow in, in order to improve, to be seen as progress, as development. And I think we have to get off of this growth oriented paradigm. And last but not least, uh, consumption is uh, ties into all of those issues because it's through consumption that we need. Uh, we extract more resources and then we contaminate the environment, um, and uh, yeah, and we create all those problems which I have mentioned earlier as well. Um, and here I've put up some of the data. Um, it's um, data comparing the 90s um, and the 2000 to 2005, and looking at different countries in terms of how much solid waste is generated per country in kilograms per year and per capita. So that makes that data comparable. And you see that um, all, of the, all of these countries portrayed here have a, a significant increase um, over those just 10 years. Um, so that means that we're still on the rise in terms of consumption and in terms of um, generating waste. Um, and there are very obvious problems, and I think these images, I've taken them at the periphery of Sao Paulo, the top images at the periphery, where um, in some 
neighborhoods there is no waste collection and so waste um, amounts in, in the waterways and it creates serious environmental and human health issues. Um, and the bottom um, picture here to your left shows uh, um, one of the main rivers which crosses the city of Sao Paulo. It's called the Pinheiros River. And once in a while they are um, they have to collect all those water bottles which get um, trapped in this line here, in this fishing net almost. And you can see the size of a car in order to get an idea of how many water bottles and, and plastic is actually accumulating in those waterways. So huge problems which create enormous costs, remediation costs. And also the other picture on your right shows um, that there are the large amount of people, of informal recyclers, which are not yet organized and we, which recover some of the resources, but of course under very serious health risks. Um, so uh, I think everybody can agree that we still have a, a global issue of increased waste generation. And there's many countries which are actually right now entering this economic uh, development model like China um, and, and India, which still have also large population growth. Um, and so there, it is a big issue. And um, so why do we generate more waste? <laughs> well, population increase, of course, but also this growth-oriented economy, but also issues, plant obsolescence. Uh, decrease product durability. We're actually constantly being incentivated to consume more, use things, um, fashioned products, so that um, yeah, this growth can continue. But also there's more packaging and if we look at, for example, the waste, waste management and the, um, the, the yellow sack program in Germany, I don't know if anybody knows about it's over the past 15 years, um, they have um, quite a strong recycling program where people separate all the recyclable materials, like here, the blue box. It goes into a yellow sack, which is made out of plastic. <laughs> um, and with this yellow sack program, much more material is recycled. However, much more material is generated because it's just so easy. <laughs> you know, it's so easy to put everything into this this sack. So there was no incentive in, in terms of reducing packaging and uh, products still continue with three, four wrappings and different packaging. Um, and also there is that final point here, the global disconnect with production and consumption. Most people actually don't know the where things are ge produced, generated and what impacts that creates to the environment and also to the people who are involved in, in the product. I think that's globalization's greatest problem is that it hides all of the ecological and the social costs. We don't see it, yeah. so you just want to buy a product and use it. And exactly. you're absolutely right. Yeah. seems to me underlying all of that, though, is that, that we're using basically air, water, and soil for free. Exactly. We're not paying. Yeah, all these environmental services yeah. are being used for free. Yeah. That's that's true, yeah. The images here, the top image is the landfill at Victoria, for Victoria, <laughs> Heartland. <laughs> and the bottom picture was taken at uh, Gramashut, where we did um, video production, which starts with images from that landfill in Rio de Janeiro. I don't know if anybody knows the movie Wasteland. Has anybody seen? Yeah. yeah, so we did this actually before Wasteland, and we also interviewed Chiang, the recycler, the main protagonist in that video. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it demonstrates the very, very serious environmental and health issues related to dumping, simply dumping waste, and then having people separate out of everything mixed. And it's, it's a huge, huge issue, but it's so common in so many countries in the world itself. 
So yeah, these are just some other pictures. The bottom one again um, at Gramasho landfill. It's a huge landfill where um, all the waste generated in the metropolitan region of Rio de Janeiro, it's more than 10 million people, goes to that landfill. Every week there is an accident because it's hundreds of people working together with the machines and, um, yeah, and working with no protection. And the other picture was taken in the northeast of Brazil, again, where also um, waste dumps is still the, the main way of, of um, managing the waste. These are some organized forms. So when I talk about the organized and cooperative recycling, that's what I mean when the, recy the informal recyclers um, organize themselves into groups and then sometimes with support of the municipal government they, um, they, do, they conduct the door-to-door -door collection of the recyclables like the picture to your right um, showing the collection in the city of Diadema where the recyclers actually go into places where no waste truck could go actually. So they, um, because it's all only access accessible by foot, and uh, so they that they also they, they contribute to building community because they are there in the in the neighborhood. They talk to the to the people. They instruct people what is recyclable and um, yeah, how to separate better. So they are really also performing the, the function of an environmental steward. You know? They do environmental education. And so usually what they do is they collect the material from the households, take them to a depot where they then separate it and then they press it and uh, sell it. Um, if they are not organized collectively, then they sell it to a middleman and they are totally exploited, of course, like usually. But if they are organized, um, they can sell, uh, they sell collectively and then they can approach the industry directly much better prices. So these graphics here, they show the, how the number of the recyclers has actually increased. And in Brazil, it's basically half percent or 0.5 percent of the population works in the recycling business, which is huge. We're talking of almost a million people working um, in, with separating, collecting and separating. And the other figure shows how the recycling has actually increased, and the data shows um, the percentage of waste um, generated in the country and how much out of that total is recycled. So there is an increase in, in recycling, and we see more and more cities actually um, implementing and supporting recycling programs and often supporting the existing uh, cooperatives. So inclusive solid waste management um, is, uh, I see it as a concept and it has this has become very clear to me actually when I went to a conference on um, transition economy where I, see, I saw, because I always had also a problem with, well we are dealing with waste and this is the resource for the recyclers. So if we generate less, then they have less to, to recycle. So where does the sustainability, where could it actually be sustainable? And then I, I actually I, I linked the issue of um, environmental stewardship and performing other, um, other functions uh, and not just recycling, but, but really being a transition stage towards an economy where we don't generate zero waste. Um, and um, that underlines a post-growth perspective, which um, some countries are doing actually quite well in terms of stimulating the debates around post-growth in Europe, but uh, of course it's much easier for those countries. They have a, popul a declining population anyways, they have declining resource availability anyway, so for them it makes sense to be at the front of this uh, discussion. And I think um, sufficiency actually needs to become our guiding principle and not efficiency. Like I think in the past we were always thinking efficiency, that's what makes us more sustainable. 
energy sufficiency, etc. But in hindsight, it has actually generated more consumption because issues, um, products become cheaper, they're more efficient, and then people consume even more. So I think we really need to focus on, on sufficiency. Enough is enough. And I, I believe that um, when linking all those social and environmental issues, then people can see actually the benefits out of this. You know, freeing up time, time which was used for consumption. Because consumption starts actually when you're already deciding over a product. And um, I've seen an interesting work on putting it in, into a time frame when um, the, the consumption consumption process started, for example, when you choose a product online, the hours you spend actually in comparing prices and finding out what product you actually want, and then the actual benefit this product gives you, if you look at it at a time span, it, it, um, it makes it very vis visible that, um, that you're also, you can actually be losing by consuming so much. And I think uh, the more we think about it, um, getting more aware about the benefits we get out of this. More time for community, more time for family, and for leisure, etc. Um, so inclusive waste management could be a strategy, a supporting strategy. It's not the only way. There's always many, many different ways of approaching. But um, particularly in this whole context which I'm presenting, I think this is, could be a good strategy. It's defined as, um, it's focusing on, of course, on reduction, reuse, recovery, and recycling practices with those organized groups, um, and uh, supported by public policies, because otherwise you don't have the continuity. If gov with government changes, um, whole programs have been dismantled, we saw that in the past, so you need to have public policies which support it. Um, and, um, yeah, to, to have that continuity in, in the program. And it's very much embedded in, in this new way of doing economy based on other values like solidarity, cooperation, etc. and aiming at social equity and environmental sustainability. And in terms of theoretical grounding, um, I take um, literature from different areas and particularly strong in terms of social and environmental justice, of course, political ecology um, gives a, a good support in terms of uh, discussing the, yeah, the, the inequity issues which, which arise from consumption and, and waste. Um, and also the aspect of governance and deliberative democracy, bottom-up approaches, participation, um, participation in or co-management approaches, because waste, as you see here, it, it's a resource, um, and it's, it's not something like garbage, like Ian said, it's actually a resource, um, and it can also be co-managed um, with the participation of those who are already doing this recovery of the, of the re recyclable materials. It also fits very well into the social and solidarity economy, uh, because it addresses um, particularly those who are marginalized and uh, who are excluded, socially and economically excluded. Um, so it generates, um, it focuses on generating workplaces, generating income, um, and also on collective processes. And finally also ecological economy, um, and um, which is another aspect of the social economy because just focusing on the social side is not enough. I think we also have to look at the resources, the environmental and the, the biodiversity side of it. And um, in addition, I've put this uh, education and conscientization because I think it's to transform society, to transform lifestyles, consumption habits. It's very much related to, to education as well. And um, I don't use the word awareness, but rather the conscientization, um, borrowing it from Paulo Freire. I don't know if anybody knows the work of Paulo Freire. Um, he's a pedagogue um, 
he, who has lived in, in Brazil and he has influenced particularly Latin America. And um, yeah, he talks a lot about this really changing the mind frame. Um, uh, and, and with that um, yeah, conscientization, then that is actually really the vehicle of changing habits and changing, yeah, changing people's behavior. Which is the most difficult thing? You probably know so so much more about that because you were working in, in praxis with, with all those issues. Um, well, the methodological approach in my research is it's community based and it's very participatory. It's action oriented, so it's very much defined by those who participate in the research, which kind of action is is needed. And, and also in terms of the theory, I think it fits very well into um, feminist or eco-feminist and, and post-colonial um, theory, which focuses on uh, these inequities and, and injustices, general injustices, be them social or environmental. Um, yeah, and I've put up here the second quote from Stucker, participation, it stimulates learning the process of knowledge production, so the co-production of knowledge, which is like a very stimulating process, and that's how we work in Brazil with my colleagues and the recyclers. It's very much actually everybody learning, everybody. <laughs> I've learned heaps out of all this, these processes. And then it's acting on knowledge power as well, like really questioning the power, and through that questioning then empowering people. Everybody has power, but sometimes people are not so aware about it, or they don't have the, the skills or the means to voice their power. And so that is the, the process of empowerment, uh, which helps yeah, to act on, on the power. Um, so uh, the project, yeah, I'm going to go a little bit quicker, but this is more like more the, the facts on, on the project itself. It's a project which was funded by CEDA. It finishes now at the end of this year. Uh, it's a collaboration between two universities and through that project um, we have done a lot of different focuses on waste and uh, recycling cooperatives in this metropolitan area of, of Sao Paulo. So it's basically through capacity development knowledge dissemination and specific research pieces to find specific answers. That's how we, we have worked over, over the past six years. And these were the themes and the principles and objectives we've elaborated through a, a workshop with the recyclers and government. Because from the beginning of the project we had always also the government as, as another stakeholder and participant in the project. And out of that workshop these were the themes which derived as key to be tackled over those six years and the principles, the guiding principles and objectives um, as people had, had put them for, forward and they so much resonate with everything I, I believe as well. So the, I brought up this um, slide here because I thought it's also interesting the way we've conducted that project because it's not not so usual to have like a deliberative management council where the uh, representatives of the beneficiaries are actually part of this council and they are actually deciding where this project would be heading to and what would be the priorities, the feedback, the critique, everything that's where it happens in this management council. Um, and uh, we've met more or less every three to four months over those years and this has also been not only it's not only a deliberative space but it has also been a very strong learning space um, sometimes it's a two days um, meeting sometimes just one day but very intense and a lot of yeah, amazing issues <laughs> coming up by with this um, yeah, collective collective approach in terms of the the research these are some of the focuses we've looked at through thesis, through smaller additional projects um, and uh, 
together with recyclers often. So focus on capacity development, uh, promotion of inclusive waste management policies, looking into the policies, uh, and very, uh, um, I think, very innovative and um, inspiring policies have come out out of some municipalities, and I think they can be also uh, inspiring us here. For example, to um, to remunerate the recyclers for the quantity of material they are actually recovering, and through that policy, then also you you can directly tackle poverty reduction. Um, so we also looked at collective commercialization so to bypass the middlemen, um, and in, in countries, particularly in countries in the global south, more than 50% of the waste is actually organic. So it's, it could be such a smaller problem of dealing with that waste, and that's why we looked at the separation of the organic and the compost, particularly the compostable waste, and using that into for composting and then... Composting. Are citizens willing to do that? Very much so, yes. Well, in that research, of course it was just a pilot. Mm -hmm. It has highlighted lots of difficulties and problems. However, we did like a, an education um, campaign first with the flyer and going and talking to the households and speaking to them and making people aware that this is also like an income generating activity for the recyclers. So they are, they um, were contributing for those two reasons. You know, to generate more social justice, but also to, to benefit the environment. Um, and yeah, the, the pilot showed that it's totally doable. The biggest problems is, are political will. <laughs> if there is no political will, you will not go nowhere. So, and to create that will is quite difficult too, often. <laughs> We've used participatory video and photo voice as empowerment measures. Um, and also gender, of course, is huge uh, because it's almost like in this room here, <laughs> in those cooperatives, uh, women dominate. <laughs> There's more women than, than men. And, um, and many of the women have <laughs> serious, <laughs> serious problems um, yeah, from home. And um, yeah, gender, gender inequity is, is still a very big issue in, in countries in and also recently we looked at the occupational health issues because you can imagine this, that activity generally has huge risks as well. And we are looking into um, carbon credit, carbon credits, and clean and recognizing this resource recovery as clean development mechanisms. We, um, we, are, we hopefully come up with a model where recyclers will be able to calculate how much they are actually contributing to as carbon credits when they separate those materials. But also, doesn't that decrease the amount of methane you get from, I mean, methane is yes. a potent greenhouse gas. Exactly. And particularly with the organic. Yes, If they exactly. work with the organic, that is key. Yeah. Well, just some pictures showing how we do the capacity building. It's always very inclusive and using all those cards, probably you work with that method too. It's very interactive and stimulate, stimulating. Here are some pictures from the organic um, project where yeah, the recycler are collecting the material. Of course, there's still many things which need to be improved. For example, the households, they deliver the material in a plastic bag. But we needed that because we wanted to quantify as well each um, household actually contributes and then of course endless meetings with government <laughs> to get their support and to, to, to keep them in the loop but it's very important that dialogue is, is very important and always I think that has also helped to increase uh, to decrease st stigmatization to decrease marginalization and to increase the voice of the recyclers we've always in all our meetings they are present there's always like one or two p people sitting next to us, and uh, that is, has become yeah, very, very strong. Here are some pictures of the work we did on, on video. Um, 
we did also that video workshop, we did do that here in, in Victoria as well with the binners. And I, I can leave a copy of that video yeah. for you then, which shows what the binners did. That's their work, what they came up with after the workshop. They had the cameras for a couple of days and they did their own video. <laughs> It's, it's quite an empowerment, it's a tool to, to empowerment. But the big issue right now is um, waste to energy and not waste to livelihoods because um, what I portrayed before is really waste as a resource which can generate livelihoods or support livelihoods. But what's happening right now in those big metropolitan areas, and it's not only in Brazil, it's happening in, in many countries, is that those the the municipalities are approached by international corporations, particularly coming from Europe, Germany, France, wanting to sell their technology, their waste to energy incineration technology. And I'm, I don't, I think I don't have to talk much about that, the environmental impacts. Um, and what I have read is that even with the most modern technology, it still generates. Um, air contaminants and particularly also um, toxic ashes or ashes which can be toxic and which need to be rem remediated. So it doesn't mean if you have an incinerator that you don't need a landfill. You will still have that rest which is between 15 to 30 percent of the original um, weight of, of waste. So for that you also need to have an end solution. And what I, but I, I think all this is more technical, but the philosophical and the most fundamental issue is that it perpetuates that lifestyle, which is not sustainable. It perpetuates growth, it perpetuates further resource extraction and expanding those frontiers into further, further regions, you know, going north in, in, into um, yeah, Alaska or wherever, you know, further into the Amazon. So, for that reason, I, I am very much against it. <laughs> but of course also, it has economic impacts because it's extremely expensive. The one they want to put in into one of the cities we are accompanying in San Bernardo do Campo, it will cost 200 million reais, which is approximately 120 million Canadian dollars. That's a lot of money which could generate a lot of recycling programs. You know, it could be invested in environmental education to generate less, etc. Um, and another big issue, and particularly this is more of an issue in, for the global south, it generates, um, it, yeah, it generates unemployment. You know, because if you have a waste to energy facility, you want to have those materials which burn most and best with the highest energy uh, content, which is plastic, cardboard, paper, and that's exactly what the recyclers um, can make money off and can retrieve out of it. Um, yeah, so I think for those reasons, here just a, a map showing the cities, the recent cities which over the past two years have been approached. There's one already uh, in, in place, one incineration in place, and all the others are still as projects. In, in view of these new developments of the technology arriving um, in that particular city, the two cooperatives, they have been threatened. I, almost every week they receive threats. They don't receive any support anymore. So it's a clear indication that the city, they want to incinerate. Because it's a big m amount of money, which means there is room for corruption. <laughs> if you have like 200 million, you know, if half a percent is missing, but doesn't, nobody will notice that. Um, yeah, so that means if that happens, increased unemployment, which will further increase social exclusion, which is one of the biggest problems in Brazil anyways. And it's because of those social exclusion, because of social injustice, that's why the rates of violence go up. And, and it actually, it, it doesn't benefit, not even the rich people benefit from it, because they have to drive uh, cars which are safe, um, bulletproof glass, they live in ghettos, they, 
their children cannot uh, play in the street. They have to. They play inside of shopping centers because there is there are guards. So I think even the rich don't really benefit from a situation which is so despair. Um, yeah. Well, we also we notice very much uh, repression and top-down decision making. I've been part of public audiences <laughs> where. The word was not given to those who were going to criticize, but um, that, that it was more mainly consulting firms and industries which were talking, and when it came to open up, uh, there was no time left. <laughs> so the process is not very um, democratic, actually. But what is happening, and that's very exciting, there is a social mobilization happening, and the recyclers, they are really going into the streets, because they don't have much to lose. You know? they, because if they lose their, yeah, it's, so they are very aware about those issues, and that's why um, they, yeah, they they are becoming so vocal as well as this quality. But are they getting things. grassroots support from? They do. Because that's what's going to be the power. If they exactly. can excite that. Yeah, they. Uh, that's a good question because they do get now local <laughs> grassroots, but also international, like uh, Gaia and No Burn. Mm -hmm. They have now. Given the the extent of this problem and issue in Brazil, they have now placed a person in São Paulo to accompany this whole issue, and uh, we've initiated um, a collaborative approach with NGOs, um, Instituto Polis, and other NGOs, which are also yeah have um, very much in support of, of the recyclers. And here, like um, one recycler said. Uh, Selective waste collection will become a topic in the next election campaign. It is in the media, like almost every week there is something in the media. And the previous government, Lula, he was very supportive to the recyclers. That's why I think they are so well structured. That's why the national movement of recyclers has um, really done that leap um, in terms of organization. And but I thought his successor is his... Yeah. Disciple, and it's a woman, so yes. she should be even more sympathetic. But unfortunately, the, very much under neoliberal pressure. Yeah, unfortunately, and and Lula too was, because the the federal law, which was very much in support of um, recycling and did not include incineration, two weeks before the 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 law was finally put out, and that was around Christmas, they had changed. Um, significantly just the order of some words which now makes it possible incineration makes is, is made a, as an option before it was like really the last option but now it's it's an option and that's the pressure of economic and political pressure the government suffers here's yeah lula that was in 2009 uh, at the an exhibit of the catadores the recyclers where he learned about the incineration this is the poster we made, <laughs> we showed him the poster and told him about that there is an issue, you know, with incineration. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, pictures showing the recyclers in the street. Um, yeah, just summing up the key highlights in terms of the opportunities linked to this work with the recyclers and the opportunity not only in Brazil, but this is an opportunity which is happening in many, many countries. There is actually a, an international movement of recyclers. Since 2008, when they had their first congress in Colombia and Bogota, um, those national movements have um, collaborated and are now working as a network as well. Um, yeah, and the, the opportunity for social inclusion and poverty reduction, environmental education, community building, just recognizing what these people are already doing. Um, yeah, and I think that picture, <laughs> that picture here, it sums up very well <laughs> what is written here on the on this card. So it shows two of the two recyclers, and on the card is written one catador or one recycler does more um, than one environment minister does. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's true they are. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true there. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Did you see the uh, grant run out because
has the government has said no more funding with this kind of program, or it, have you completed what you wanted to do? Oh, we have, well, we have completed this project, but unfortunately CEDA does not fund this kind of university partnership projects anymore. through AUCC anymore. And is that, a harbor, is that a harbor kind of mandate, or? Um, it could be. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> I think it, yeah, it probably it reflects the uh, yeah. yeah, federal policies. However, we did, um, over the past couple of months, we have written a new proposal and have submitted it to the Brazilian government, to the Secretariat of Solidarity Economy, and we got approval. So we have now funding to do work in Brazil, particularly in Brazil, for three years. What about Curitiba, which we always cite as the example of what, what can be done? Is it uh, one of the most advanced in terms of recycling? Not in terms of recycling. Mm -hmm. They have started actually with recycling and they have had um, innovative approaches in terms of... Paying people to yeah, bring in exactly. Yeah, exactly. But in terms of really focusing on zero waste and social inclusion, there's other much better examples like Londrina, or the city I mentioned here, Diadema, is, is also like really a highlight of what they are doing and um, yeah, there is very good examples we can learn from and um, yeah, we've documented it quite a, a bit also with more approachable material like this booklet which I believe of course and the videos, I think video and the visual is, is quite important too and yeah, there's Publications too, which I can can send and give them here. Sorry, Nitting, I seem to be dominating. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave. But thank you very much for for coming. This is absolutely fascinating. If there's some way that we can help or whatever. Great. Yeah, I was very interested in. I don't know if you would see a possibility of making a video, for example, about this waste to energy. Mm. I think it's a very polemic issue, and it needs more. You mean for the nature of things? Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately, you know, I, I did a show last year in Peru. This, I've been pushing for a series on South America because I believe that that's where the really big change, you know, from Venezuela to Cuba mm -hmm. to Bolivia, Ecuador. And so I got permission to do one more show this year, which is Bolivia. But uh, I would love to do a series, mm -hmm. including Brazil, because Brazil has gone from what we thought was a basket case, mm -hmm. you know, into one of the powerhouses. Yeah. And of course, they've done it by genetically engineered soil and all that stuff. Exactly, like that. by expanding the frontier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <gasps> but we don't have the capacity to do videos, do we, here in the foundation? Not much, really. I mean, we sometimes we have volunteers that do, you know, short videos yeah. for us, but that's... Anyway, I hope you spark some ideas at the beginning here. <laughs> issue in Canada, I'm wondering where you think the biggest gains can be made. Do you think it's in uh, uh, social norm change around consumption or do you think it's putting pressure on manufacturers to um, you know, manufacture more recyclable goods or less packaging? Like they're both important, but which one do you, th like realistically, do you think like in the next five years we'll see the biggest 
gains and like where should an organization like ours be mm -hmm. sort of focusing our messaging? What do you, what do you think? As you said, both are extremely important. You, yeah. know, you cannot just focus on, on the consumer. Yeah. However, I, I still think that it's probably easier to reach the consumer instead of re reaching those who are in power and economic power to, to change. But um, while those you can reach through policy changes, and that means actually being influential in politics to be able to reach those who, who do make the policies. But I think it's, it's as important as. But however, I think the consumer um, might be easier to, re to be reached because of uh, through the media, you know, you have more access to the media. And schools, I think schools, education is. is Are vendors organized in the lower you know, they there's they are not really very well organized. The only organization which exists is United We Can, which is like a more of a social enterprise. It's not really a cooperative, but it is a it's an enterprise with a more social approach. So it um, provides benefits to the bidders there. It has a space for them. We have had a couple of meetings with them, and I've given presentations about the recyclers in Brazil and. They were so so um, yeah, surprised and, and very motivated by what's happening in Brazil. And Ken Loitier actually he came to Brazil and he visited and he participated and saw the recyclers movement and organization. Yeah, so they provide a depot here for recyclers, but they also provide carts for binners. That's the UBU, yeah, the urban binning unit. That is a very innovative and very creative approach too. I think that's something Victoria could definitely learn from. And I think that's yeah, that's really, really good ex um, example which shows that you can do small things which have great impact. Um, I have a question about, because um, you mentioned that when 5% of Brazilians are actually working in the recycling industry. So for our work, oftentimes that we do see that if we actually tell uh, when we do campaigning with the uh, the grassroots and people, and especially the young people, that jobs is definitely a big attraction. So green jobs, it's something that they will stop and listen. But you also talked about that the way to go is really to 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 promote sufficiency. Mm -hmm. So if you're successful on the sufficiency side, then there's not much to be recycled. So that will compromise that job opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, as I mentioned, I, I see it more as a transition towards mm -hmm. sufficiency. Of course, I would love for sufficiency to happen tomorrow, mm -hmm. but realistically, I think it will take very, very long for, for people to really embrace sufficiency. Um, so if we see it as a transition, that means also that people and their um, jobs and their dedication can change and adjust to situations from a more resource recovery to a more um, service-oriented um, educational function. Um, yeah, I, and, and also I think that um, Zero waste does not mean that we are not generating anything, because I think we will always generate waste. Be human beings, and not only human beings, every being <laughs> generates waste. It's just what we do with this waste. So for example, even the, the organic waste, if we generate more organic waste and, and much less recyclable, then we can generate more employment also through the collection and, and the use of the organic waste. So I think Sufficiency does not mean not consuming anymore or not generating. I think that would be almost impossible. But um, to generate those things which are recyclable, because we are still generating too many products which cannot even be recycled, which go into the landfill. And so that, to me, zero waste means that you eliminate those products which cannot be recycled just don't generate that and the others get reused and or recycled. Why are we why are we recycling compost now? Like I know when I was living in New Brunswick, we didn't have a 
blue bins, which just threw me, but we had compost bins. Mm -hmm. And here we've got blue bins, but we don't have compost bins. I have compost bins. Yes. She, think she means um, 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 the metro, the city does. It's like city yeah, yeah, the city picks it up. But yeah, it's, it's, only, it's a pilot project. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's also only single family uh, dwellings. Uh, if you live in a pilot unit. Oh, okay. Yeah, it exists, but it's not city one. Mm, okay. Yeah, but even, um, I don't know if it's the same in New Brunswick as it is in Halifax, but they, the reason why they don't have buildings is because they have their own contract for waste collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering, it's a small thing, but we had someone in line at a London Drugs, and the woman was buying a curling iron or something, and she asked for scissors, and she cut up all the packaging, and there was like, tons of packaging on this mm -hmm. thing, and she pushed it back to the cashier, and the cashier said, you know, kind of looked at her, and um, the woman turned to me and to the cashier and said, by law, packaging, you know, you have, if you sell this, you have to be willing to yeah. deal with all of it. So is that a trick? That's correct, yeah. Because that would be an, an easy campaign thing, yeah. a public campaign yeah. thing for people, you know, it would change mm -hmm. if, if retailers, you know, maybe mm -hmm. they would choose different products mm -hmm. if they had to deal with all of that, if that is a law, and it would be such an easy public yeah. campaign for yeah. someone like DSL. Yeah. You know, that has, I've observed that in Germany quite often, and particularly at drugstores. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the drugstores have actually adjusted to that by putting bins there. Mm. But I, it, does, it has not changed the, the amount the of packaging. It okay. still comes, like the toothpaste still comes in a cardboard package. You know, it doesn't yeah. have to, but it comes. Yeah. And I would worry that it might not be getting recycled too. <laughs> I would. That would go the garbage. Yeah. Well, they said there, is, there are. Um, bins in London Drugs, and I actually ended up asking the pharmacist because it's a friend of ours, and he said no, they have put in up like they do batteries, cell phones, they they cell TVs. Phones. And they'll take stuff, a lot of stuff, mm -hmm. London Drugs that the city won't take. Yeah, yeah, and be, but because I don't, I didn't know for sure if the law was actually on the books or if they were doing mm -hmm. it, but the law is there. I I don't know whether it exists really as a law or whether it's just a recommendation. But um, I know that in, in Germany, yes, it is a law. They have to take it back. Um, and yes, those people who are who know more about it and who are more conscious, they actually do exactly that. Right there. One of the ways I often see like incineration frame is that you know we're reaching our capacity in our landfills, and so we need to we need more capacity. So we can either expand our landfills, or we can. Um, Build incinerators and generate some some energy from that. I'm just wondering if you have a sense of what the, the trade offs are, like environmentally, between an incinerator, obviously there's all the particulate or like the furons and all that, versus uh, landfill, and obviously there's environmental impacts from that as well. Are they in the same ballpark, you think, or is, are the impacts of the incinerators uh, like a degree of magnitude worse than the, uh, the landfills? You know, um, I think both are not good options. Right. And both are focused on growth, on further growth. So unless we really look at how to reduce the growth, yeah. it will continue, either incineration or landfill. Of course, landfill is, 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 uh, has huge yeah. impacts as well, and is very costly too. Like our messaging is always, you know, zero waste as well. That's what we're trying to aspire yeah. to. But in the meantime, obviously, that's going to take time to get to that stage where we're um, recycling, where we're producing far less waste. So people want to know what our take is, what, what should our strategy be in the meantime. I think the strategy needs to be no growth. Yeah. Really. Off that. Yeah. yeah. I think one of the things you mentioned to me once before, too, was the, um, the idea that with incineration, then waste becomes a fuel commodity, sure, and so yeah. it becomes valuable as mm -hmm. as, yeah. as a fuel yeah. rather than yeah. as and so you know there there becomes a demand for it. So it's this incentive to recycle. Yeah. Yeah. but it's a resource, as you said, without incinerating it. And people, I'm surprised, aren't mining the landfills. They are here, but they're not doing it. Well, it's actually incinerating is actually very energy inefficient because all that energy which went into producing that material, you know, is not even, is not considered. So you have to um, put all that new energy into producing the new product 
And if they would wait that and showcase it like that, I think then it, yeah, people would see that it's obviously a, not a win-win situation. When I, when I lived in Central Australia, they had an organized landfill there, and it just completely changed my perception. Like, we think of like landfill here, it's just like piles of garbage, mm -hmm. you know? And there, they actually split everything out, and then also acted as a second-hand store that you could go oh, yeah. and buy it. And it was actually like, it was part of the community where, they, you know, they had art shows there where people would make things out of the recycled material, and like, you know, if you needed part of your washer, like for a washer, you'd go to the washer section. If you needed like a bunch of tires or something, you'd go to the big pile of tires. And yeah. I mean, not everything was separated out, but yeah, it, it was just shocking, you know, like piles of car batteries, piles of everything. It was it was like a place that you wanted to be in. It makes totally yeah. sense. Something similar happens here on Hornby. Oh yeah, Maine on, and Hornby, Hornby Island. Um, we flew into that. There, the community also because of necessity, because you know that it was too expensive to ship all that huge amounts of waste off the island. Um, that's why the people came up with that idea of having a recycling depot and then have a free store there. And then it turned out to be like the biggest community attraction. You know, people go there on Saturdays to meet, <laughs> to go through the free store, and there's always a new book or a new DVD or something. Yeah, yeah, they even had like a like a cafe inside yeah. the center of the building. Yeah. So the junk business used to be a lot of people. My grandfather had a junk yeah. shop. Yeah. And you don't hear, I mean, they're recycling companies now, but it's not the same where you could go in and sort through every all of the stuff that was sorted through and find that piece that you were missing. And that's the way. And also, stores, I mean, packaging is pretty new. It's, it's a new innovation, and it, it has to do with obsession about not touching things and, and everything being disinfected. You used to be able to go to a store and just there'd be a pile of you know whatever and you take one, like a scissors or a curling iron or something. Yeah. And now everything's, you know, yeah. and sanitization. It's so strange. It's interesting too with like with the binners here, like you know, you, you see a lot of them that are just collecting bottles and things that are easily recyclable, but I've come across some. Like there's one guy that goes down our alley and he's, he, I was talking to him because he wouldn't believe what people throw away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he, he doesn't just pick up bottles, he says, you know, I find yeah. televisions and radios that work fine. He says, I find uh, I find perfectly good food, I find clothing, he says, I find metal that I can sell to scrap metal with you. He says it's amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's people there's Actually, the grocery store is a trigger because you have to hear somebody around the story about people scrounging, like making mm -hmm. My cousin all their food, food. Metal, but, but getting all their food. <laughs>